All right, should probably go ahead and get started. I see there's two people here, so I can use my normal hi folks greeting. Uh, Travis McMacken back again to do my favorite thing on the internet, which is talk about theology. And today I'm going to be talking about this book, uh, Trip Fuller. You can see his name right at the bottom there, his entry in the Homebrewed Christianity Guides series. Jesus, Lord, Liar, Lunatic, or Awesome. And if you read the book, you'll discover that Tripp originally wanted the subtitle to be Lord, Liar, Lunatic, or Freaking Awesome, uh, which I think uh, captures the whole tone of the uh, book. So I'm going to talk about that. And I decided I'd try this as a live stream just because I wanted to play around with YouTube Live and uh, see how that worked. Um, and afterwards, if there's still folks hanging around, I will try my best to answer any questions that you enter into the chat. So that might be fun as well. And then I'll trim this up and post it to my channel and all that uh, normal good stuff. So let me get my little piece of paper with notes out of the book so I can talk about it a little bit. I want to start by talking about Trip himself. I've known Trip for a while now, um, just about a decade, I think. We met uh, just online, on the internet, talking about theology in a lot of the same places. It was primarily blogs back then. And then he started the Homebrewed Christianity podcast and community, and that really took off. And um, he's been nice enough to have me on the podcast two or three times at this point, I think. And then he even brought me to uh, one of the beer camps, the theology beer camps that he puts on. So I was down with him in Asheville for that last summer, and that was a lot of fun, talking about theology while drinking beer in a very, very beautiful little town or city, I guess you'd want to call it. Uh, Trip is, so Trip is a really interesting individual. If you've met him, uh, you know that he is a unique individual. Uh, I think the word raconteur, he's a, he's a skilled raconteur. He's a good storyteller, good conversationalist, lots of fun. He likes to keep people on their toes. And I'm I'm pretty quick on my feet when it comes to conversation uh, and usually not at a loss for words or a way to reply uh, when somebody puts something to me. But there have been a number of times where Trip has caught me uh, flat on my feet with uh, one thing or the other. And so that's uh, something of an achievement, I think. And he he's good at um, getting people wrong footed and seeing what comes out of their mouths and then running with it in interesting directions. Um, all of this comes out in the book, and that's just one of the great achievements, I think, uh, of this book that he's written, is that personality shines through a great deal. This is not a boring, dusty theology book. Uh, even uh, if you like boring, dusty, th dusty theology books like I do, you will also enjoy this kind of jocular, um, running joke, uh, always uh, making you think along with making you laugh, uh, writing style that Tripp has, and it's very much like hearing him talk. So when I was sitting and reading this book, I felt like I had Tripp there uh, chatting through things with me, and that was a lot of fun. Uh, one thing I'll say, uh, Tripp and I are just about the same age, and we were both in college when 9-11 happened. And so we each have stories about being in a Christian college when 9-11 happened and attending chapel services about that. Now, he tells his in this book, beginning on page 133, maybe someday I'll tell mine publicly, but so far I haven't done that. Uh, we'll see if anybody ever drags it out of me. I want to start uh, by getting into the book and just talking about a few of the great lines that Tripp has in here. He has a good way of um, bringing things uh, together and stating it really concisely in, in a, a way that packs a punch. And I just identified four or five of those that I picked up throughout the book that I wanted to highlight. So the first one is on page 20, he says, you cannot put love in a math equation and you cannot turn hope into a syllogism. And of course, that warmed my heart as somebody in the uh, modern university. Uh, we deal with all kinds of bureaucratic systems these days in the neoliberal university. Uh, environment, as we've been trained to say. And it's all about quantifying and statistical analysis and things like that. Uh, but Tripp's statement uh, reminds us that when it comes to what it means to be human at the deepest level, uh, you can't put that into mathematics. You can't put it into a syllogism. You can't put it into an equation. And there's a whole realm of human experience and human existence and human significance and meaning uh, that transcends uh, what can be coded in binary. And I think that's super important to remember. And it's really important to, uh, to remember that when you're doing theology. There's lots of um, more or less analytically rigorous ways of doing theology. And if we were to lose the less analytical ways, the more mystical and spiritualist ways, uh, that would be a great loss. 
Also on this page, he gives you a set of principles for Christology, uh, the study of Jesus and Jesus' theological significance. Uh, he says, keep theolo Christology crazy, keep Christology crazy. And when I read that, it made me think of a country song. Uh, so I don't know what the title is or uh, what country artist sings it, uh, but the song has a line in it that says, God is great, beer is good, and people are crazy. And so I wish that uh, Tripp would have played around with that lyric. He could have changed it into something like, Jesus is great, beer is good, and Christology is crazy. So maybe that could be a theme for an upcoming Theology Beer Camp trip. Uh, get out your notepad, write that down, a Theology Beer Camp with the tagline, Jesus is great, beer is good, and Christology is crazy. The next little quote I wanted to highlight for you is on page 43. And I've heard Tripp say this a bunch of times, and it's kind of in my mind, uh, one of the theological claims that I most associate with Tripp, and I think it's really valuable uh, that he's distilled it in this way. He says, God has to be at least as nice as Jesus. God has to be at least as nice as Jesus. And I think that's just incredibly important to any of our conceptions of God, uh, especially when we get into the realm of ethics and morality and how we treat other human beings. God has to be at least as nice as Jesus. And of course, Jesus could be incredibly nice to people who were mistreated by society and outcasts and so on, uh, and then incredibly harsh toward people who had uh, seemingly everything and then continued to uh, oppress others. So God has to be just as nice as Jesus. Any values that we think God has uh, have to be reflected in the values that Jesus had. It made me think of a story that um, T.F. Torrance uh, tells in a number of places in his writings about when he was a military chaplain in World War II. He talks about coming upon a very gravely wounded a uh, soldier uh, in his duties as chaplain, and the soldier uh, is very uh, fearful of dying. Uh, and he asks Torrance, uh, is God really like Jesus? And Torrance says, yes, God really is like Jesus. This whole idea that uh, God has to be at least as nice as Jesus. Or when you look at Jesus, you are in fact seeing God as the cornerstone of all other Christian claims. So I don't know if you can see on this uh, screen, there are these little uh, sidebars, so to speak, in the Homebrew Christianity Guide series uh, with different uh, personalities all their own that will pop in kind of like commentary, running commentary on the text. So that's just kind of a fun piece. But one of them uh, here makes the observation that too many want a childish faith rather than a childlike faith, and they never grow past it. And I thought that was a real nice turn of phrase. Uh, the distinction between childish and childlike. And uh, we all know those Bible verses where Jesus spent time with the children and said, don't keep the children from coming to me and you need to believe like these little ones believe and so on. Um, and Tripp's trying to make the point that it's not about thinking in childish ways, refusing to recognize the realities of the world, the dynamics at play, uh, the very uh, broken ways in which the world works. Um, but so it's not a, a kind of intellectual self-abdication, so to speak, or a, a rejection of responsibility and maturity. But uh, it goes back to, uh, in my mind, the social position of children in those contexts. And it's very different than uh, things are today. Uh, we've had evangelical groups for decades in our country pushing on us the uh, significance of children and how important the nuclear family is, as we defined it in the West. We've got groups like Focus on the Family doing this. And then you've got Bible verses where Jesus is like uh, paying no attention to his family and his mother and brothers come to get him. He's like, who are my mother and brothers? It's these people right here that I'm hanging out with, not my biological family. So Jesus very much subverted uh, those social norms in his own society and the ones with children especially. So children um, were basically socially social non-entities uh, in that environment. They didn't have uh, very many rights at all. They were uh, marginalized, uh, viewed as uh, fairly unimportant until they became old enough to help uh, sustain the family or provide um, benefits to the family unit. So uh, when Jesus says, you know, the children are important, be like the children, uh, he's talking about uh, marginalized peoples in any given society. So uh, to have a childlike faith in that sense is to have uh, a faith in solidarity with the oppressed. Uh, and I think that's a really important point to bring out as well. So, uh, oh yes, uh, page 83. This is a little uh, editorial uh, comment that I have for Trip. Trip, if you ever end up watching this, 
uh, trip is talking about how Jesus hung out with the social outcasts and so on. Uh, and he sums this up by saying, I'm telling you, Jesus partied. And this idea of Jesus partied is a good one, and I'm in favor of it. But Tripp, you missed a golden opportunity. You needed to make that a sentence all by itself so that it would be the shortest sentence in your book, just like the shortest sentence in the Bible is Jesus wept. So that on the one hand, you'd have Jesus wept, but also Jesus partied. And I think that would make a nice uh, parallel that you uh, totally missed out on. And I can't believe you dropped the ball on that one. I expected more of you. And then finally, for the last uh, just great line I want to highlight for you on 132, back to the uh, theme of love and the way love and certain aspects of human existence and God are not reducible to uh, binary, so to speak. Tripp says, love is not, isn't a zero-sum game. We do not possess love, and we cannot possess God. So this idea of uh, a theological logic that is not tied up in zero-sum games. And Catherine Tanner, uh, for her whole career, basically, has been trying to make this point, beginning uh, with her first book on creation and the doctrine of God and continuing on through all of her uh, both theological and political work. She's advanced this idea that divine and human agency are non-competitive. They don't operate at the same level, and so they cannot clash with each, with each other in a competitive way, in a zero-sum kind of way, where you only have a 100 things and you have to divvy them up somehow. Uh, so learning to think in a non-competitive way means thinking without scarcity, thinking without exclusive possession. And that's the kind of point Tripp's trying to make here. It's human beings never possess God in that way. Uh, God cannot be exhaust, uh, exhausted. It's just not part. God is not part of a zero-sum game. Uh, you cannot possess God. You cannot possess love. These are all things that we share together in a non-competitive way. And uh, too often we corrupt that in our own thinking and our own lives. So those are just some of the great lines uh, that I enjoyed as I read through Tripp's book. I really recommend that uh, if you dig in there and, and find your own favorite lines. What I want to do next is highlight um, one of the great stories that Tripp tells uh, throughout the book that I really enjoyed. It's a story uh, from his uh, college days, and it begins on page 36. And it goes uh, for quite a number of pages. I'm going to stop uh, on page 38, uh, but I, I just wanted to read this because I think it illustrates the great way that Tripp weaves personal narrative and uh, larger awareness of what's going on in society and then also uh, particular Christian uh, subcultures in our society. So Tripp says, when I first got into historical Jesus studies in college, I went to a public lecture by a famous New Testament scholar who specializes in scaring Bible Belt literal literalists out of their Sunday certitude. And I uh, really want to know who this was, Trip. I have my guesses. So uh, hit me up on the DMs on Twitter or something uh, and tell me who this was. It wasn't too long after the tragic events of September 11, 2001. The drumbeat for war was raging, nationalism was on the rise, and American religious superiority was assumed by the masses. I don't remember him touching current events at all, but he gave a powerful lecture on Jesus's understanding of the kingdom of God, its alternative ec economics, opposition to violence, and radical openness to the other, and on Jesus's insistence that genuine hope was in what God was doing and not what those in power were doing. I was moved and challenged by the time the Q&A started, but there was an evangelical pastor in the crowd who was not amused, not at all. The question from the clergyman sounded more like a sermonette or a screed. He began with an apology, quote, I'm sorry so many Bible-believing Christians were forced to listen to your academic gobbledygook. Why don't you just come out and say it? Tell us your opinion straight up and stop using big words, pictures of stuff someone dug up in the desert, and stories about a bunch of false messiahs in Jesus' day, end quote. The scholar responded like he had handled this before and said with just a hint of a smirk, quote, I am glad to try to be clear with you. Just tell me the part you missed in the form of a question, end quote, which is just, you know, totally baller on his part. Well, the pastor responded, let's say your Jesus was president of America and was deciding what the righteous and just thing to do is with all these Muslim terrorists, murderers, and the like. Do you want me to believe that he, was, he wouldn't bomb the hell out of them and protect the God-given freedoms we enjoy here in this blessed nation of ours? Correct, the scholar responded. There was a significant pause as the rest of the room uncomfortably connected the dots. Then the historian spoke again. I wish I had a good parable for you. You see, this is the kind of conversation Jesus was so good at. 
He would have answered your question with a story. The crowd would have loved it. It would have got you talking on the way home, and then that Trojan horse would open up, and all the privilege and power being protected in your question would be under attack. But I am sure we both agree that I'm not Jesus, so I'm stuck being direct. So here it is. Jesus would never be elected president because he refused to bow his knee to Satan during his wilderness temptation, and he constantly identified himself with the outcast and the suffering. I am confident Jesus would have mourned with all those who mourned after 9-11, but I am equally confident he would be praying that our loss and fear not become cancerous and lead to war. After all, now that we know who our enemies are, we know just who Jesus has commanded us to love. And I'm going to stop there. The story continues with how the uh, particular clergyman uh, responded, and I uh, encourage you to look that up, but uh, I'm going to stop there for right now. And I think that that story jumped out at me, um, especially as I read this book recently because of all the uh, posturing in the news with reference to Iran. Uh, after 9-11, we had the invasion of Afghanistan, and then later on, we saw history repeat itself again with uh, the invasion of Iraq, and now a lot of the same people and a new uh, administration are talking about Iran, and I really hope that we don't end up uh, letting history repeat itself a third time with that particular history. And so I think Trip is uh, very helpful in highlighting the dynamics that were at play, both at that moment after 9-11 uh, and in uh, the story. Uh, the stories that surround Jesus's life and how Jesus related to power. Um, very, very good food for thought for us. Some uh, general comments about the book uh, in general. I could have done, Trip. Uh, I'm sure uh, you guess I would say this. I could have done with all the processy stuff in chapter six. Uh, Trip spends a good bit of time toward the back end of chapter six uh, talking through uh, process theology and some very light and honestly really uh, well explained uh, in layman's terms, uh, process metaphysics, uh, toward the end of chapter six in connection with John Cobb. Uh, I could have done without that, but I know why he put it in there and it's his book, so he can do him. Uh, I did appreciate how he handled chapter five. Chapter five is all about Anselm and Luther, and he gives uh, really charitable uh, interpretations of them and does a great job bringing out the positive logic of what they were trying to do theologically. Uh, even uh, when they made plenty of missteps uh, along the way. One, one complaint I do have about chapter five is he starts off by bashing Calvinists, and uh, that's all well and good. I mean, who doesn't like to engage in, in the game of uh, smack a Calvinist uh, intellectually, so to speak? Uh, but, of course, uh, we can't let this unjustly color our perception of Calvin and the Reformed tradition in general. Calvinists are their own breed. Also in chapter five, uh, which I thought was uh, just brilliant, uh, Tripp has a theological reflection on cooties. You might remember from being uh, children when people contracted this mysterious social disease called cooties and became uh, untouchable, as it were, in your little childhood society for a period of time. Um, Tripp actually picks this up and uses it as a way of helping us think about sin and how sin is socially constructed and how it gets translated into social structures. And so that was just the highlight of the book for me, watching him play around with that concept and turn it in to this really illuminating uh, example of uh, a really important theological material. Uh, Christians in the United States, Americans in general, have a hard time thinking about social structure because we're so individualistic and so much of our rhetoric is tied up with individualistic freedom. Uh, especially in the church, we have difficulty with the concept of structural sin. And trip stuff on cooties, I think, if we can get past the chuckle factor, uh, can do some good work helping us uh, tease that out and explain it to folks. So uh, just to wrap up talking about Tripp's book, um, how would I use this book? One, one thing that struck me um, of, as I read this book is just how old Tripp and I are getting. Um, I spent my, the last fall semester, so I'm recording this in uh, May of 2019, and in the fall semester of 2018, I taught my Jesus class, that, which I teach every few years. And uh, I spent that semester working through uh, the person of Jesus from a number of different theological and religious uh, and uh, academic perspectives. Um, working with, through, the, uh, through all that with a group of 18 to 20 year olds primarily, with a few uh, slightly older uh, students scattered in there. And I had to find ways to communicate with them. And I had to get up to speed 
uh, and, and get creative with uh, some new ways to communicate to a generation that I am no longer part of. I mean, millennial is a big generation. I'm really at the front end. I'm right on the edge between older millennial and, and younger Gen X and Trip is right there with me. And um, I had to gen- uh, communicate to really young millennials and even some uh, Gen Y uh, folks, uh, which is a whole new ball game. And so as I read Trip's book, I realized that he has written this for people of about his and my age. And uh, people of about his or my age are going to understand it and connect with it uh, really effortlessly. And um, he, he trades on that shared generational and cultural uh, knowledge uh, to communicate in really, really compelling and uh, simple ways, simple in the best sense ways, uh, all of this uh, important stuff about Jesus. I, it would not work in my classroom uh, with 18 year olds. Uh, They would miss the references. Uh, They would uh, look for other kinds of um, social uh, illustrations and so on. So I don't know that this is a book that I could use uh, in that classroom. I'm still kind of pondering it. Um, It it definitely wouldn't, like if I was working with students uh, in the late 20s, in their late 20s right now, I could throw them this book as kind of a gateway drug into the rest of the material. I don't think it would function in quite the same way for younger students. Um, but that means it's probably going to be, uh, really useful in the context of, uh, Christian communities, especially for folks who are in that kind of millennial category, especially the older half of millennial, um, they will connect with it easily. So you can, you know, think about brew theology groups or, uh, communities like homebrew Christianity. They're going to connect with it really easily. If I was teaching in seminary and I was going to teach a class on Jesus, I would probably throw that out there as, hey, in the first week, read this book and write a book review, uh, a real quick, you know, response paper to it just as a way of uh, orienting the course. Uh, I think it could serve uh, that way. I think it would work in uh, church uh, Sunday schools and Bible study context, depending on the age range of the people you've got involved in that. Uh, you get to the top end of Gen X and it's gonna, gonna age out in the other direction. So there's lots of possible applications here if you're looking for resources to do uh, teaching in a Christian context on uh, the subject of Jesus for theological beginners. Uh, it has uh, a lot of legs that way, lots of different uses you can put it to. And I've just been trying to think through uh, what the upper and lower limits, so to speak, of that use uh, might be. So uh, once again, Trip has produced an excellent little introduction, lots of fun to read, highly recommend it. You're going to enjoy it. You'll find yourself laughing at different points and groaning, uh, maybe not crying. Trip, as far as I can tell, doesn't usually try to make people cry uh, unless they're crying because they're laughing so hard. So if you don't know homebrewed Christianity, uh, look it up online, just Google it. It'll come right up. Uh, poke around, see if you like to get involved. Check out the podcast, look for my episodes, of course, Listen to those each about a thousand times, and uh, that'll get you uh, acclimated to uh, Trip and Homebrewed and everything that he's trying to accomplish there. So more power to him, and I was really happy to read the book.